Good morning and welcome. Please make your way to the book of 1 John, if you have not already, chapter 2. We will turn a couple pages this morning, so you want to keep a, a ribbon or a bookmark there in 1 John. The book of 1 John is unique in many ways, but one thing that we notice that is characteristic of what the Lord is doing through our brother is as he teaches a subject and then expounds on it and introduces more things, well, then he'll come back to it and build more. So we see a lot of things introduced, expanded and explained, and then gone back to, and that's the process, I think, with everything, actually, the Lord does as he brings us forward. So you're going to see some of that today. So as we focused a little bit more last week, we, well, we took a passage of Scripture and we looked specifically at part of it while introducing the part we're going to look at today. And today, well, we're doing that same thing. So if you have your Bibles open to 1 John chapter 2, Let us read the passage, and we're primarily going to focus on verses 24 through 27 while introducing where the Lord is taking us next week, should he tarry. So 1 John chapter 2, verse 24, the Lord says, Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning, if... What you heard from the beginning abides in you. You also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Father, we thank you, Lord, for you, who you are, what you're doing, your plan. And Father, what you've put on my mind and moved me to pray earlier, I pray again, Lord, that for your good pleasure, Father, for your honor, that everyone would truly meet with you today in the fullest measure that you make possible. Lord, that you would be joyful. Your joy would remain in us and our joy would be full. Father, we ask for all the things that you know are needful. We ask, Lord, that you make them happen. Father, in I ask that you show us and explain them to us so we're willing participants as you continue to conform us into the image of your Son. Father, for your glory, we ask thanking you in faith in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So now we need to break these things down, and if we're looking for a title for the teaching today is... Let that remain. There's really only two things that we need to take away from here, and all the things that are explained will be part of, well, understanding that, is something is supposed to remain with us, and we're supposed to leave here knowing how that's going to happen. So those are the two things within context of the teaching. Well, the greater book of 1 John, what is it about? Well, it's about the relationship of the redeemed, born-again Christians with Jesus, right? Koinonia Fellowship, 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. We defined as having all things in common with him, Jesus being the example, right? The evidence of when that happens, 
you're happy. And you're happy because he's happy. We learned about that in, well, 1 John, as we prayed earlier, that his joy would remain in you. God is happy when his children are safe and abiding with him. And as a fruit, fruit of his working, you're happy. Joy, fruit of the Spirit. It's simple and profound at the same time. So since the focus is on, well, relationship with Jesus, defined as having all things in common, we've previously at the beginning said the whole book of 1 John is about things that either help to make that happen or hinder, prevent, or keep that from happening. Helping? Oh, abiding. Boy, is that going to come out clear. In the book of 1 John, that English word abide and its variants, 20 times in 15 verses. That's a lot for a little book. That, that signals that this is a theme, right? And what does abide mean? Well, it means remain. Very good translations, literal translations will translate it. Even in this passage that we're going to look at here, let that remain in this one, let that abide. Greek word meno, come to the Lord and stay with the Lord. Now that, this is the main, what? Well, we'll get into that in a moment. But all of it, again, is the context with this is the kind of relationship that the Lord has made possible and wants and is working us towards. That's why he has us here. That's why we're talking about this today. He's prepared us for this moment. Things that help, abiding. Things that hinder, anything else. In a broad category, sin. Anything that God doesn't want. It's, well, it's counted to walking in darkness. But the Lord says, walk in the light as he is in the light, and we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ cleanses us from everything we did wrong. All unrighteousness. Okay, so moving quickly through this, we saw in our beginning of chapter 2, the first two verses, that only Jesus can make this happen. Not just what he did, but who he is right now. He's our propitiation. He's the only one in that that makes it happen. And then the Lord gave us through the teachings of our brother in chapter 2 two things that would be clear evidences if we have the kind of relationship, if we're letting the Lord make the kind of relationship that he wants us. And those were, first one, obedience. If we keep his commandments, by this we know that we know him. And love for the brethren. So what is true of Jesus, if we're connected with Jesus, becomes true of us. So helpful questions are this. Do you think that's true of Jesus? Did he keep his father's commandments? Oh, well, yeah, we'll see it again. I'll, we'll chapter and verse it for you. And did he love his brethren? Well, yeah. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. So there it is. And when we're abiding, connected to Jesus, what's true of him becomes true in us, just as when a branch abides in the vine, it bears the fruit that that vine is capable of. So here we are today with a little bit more explanation, a little bit more encouragement. And it, well, it starts out in this verse, verse 24. Therefore... It connects us to what we looked at in more depth last week. Therefore, well, therefore refers to something that you and I are subject to as long as we're here on this earth in this body. And that is the workings of the enemy, Satan, through human beings to, well, do things that are contrary to God's will to take God's people and deceive them, lead them astray. And where does it happen most effectively? Where's the focus? And we gave more support to this last week. It happens in the church. People come in from outside into the church and they don't represent themselves as, your attention please, I'm working for the enemy. They represent themselves as, working for Jesus as his, right? False apostles. 
angels of light. We looked at the verses. Now that's evil coming in from the outside into the fellowship where everything is good and right. That's really what fellowship is. It's not just us getting together. It's you and I connected with Jesus, staying with Jesus, coming together. And that's what happens. And Satan says, well, let me send a guy in that, you know, well, it's a wolf, but we'll put a sheep suit on him, right? So the sheep, well, you know, sheep don't, well, no, it's just a sheep, we're okay. But inwardly, ravenous wolves. And then, well, the sheep are turned aside from the good shepherd. So another thing is, it doesn't just happen by means of evil coming in from the outside, but it happens from the inside also. God warned us. Any one of us redeemed men from amongst yourselves, men will raise up. And amongst yourselves, in that context, believers can be turned aside. Jesus said, take heed that no one deceives you. Why would Jesus warn us? Because it can happen to us. You'll still be with him, right? But it won't be the way that we want as far as finishing the race. It won't be the way that he wants. That's what hangs in the balance, brothers and sisters. Joy, fellowship, fruitfulness right now, and glory to him for all eternity. That's what, again, hangs in the balance. So, the therefore... Knowing that even if you're in a good place now, you're subject to evil forces from without, and even you yourself can turn aside, the Lord gives us encouragement here. Verse 24. And it's so simple. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. There. Short one today. Now you know. You'll never, ever have to worry about turning aside. Just let that, you know, remain in you. Abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. Two things. What is that? which you heard from the beginning. Before we break down the rest of the verses today, I want to do this in the context of a portion of John, the Gospel of John chapter 8. Keep this in mind and for your studies because we're coming back to John chapter 8 for next week as well. So keep your marker here. Make your way to the left to the Gospel of John, the 8th chapter, and we're going to pick it up partway in Uh, right after Jesus' encounter with the uh, woman who was caught in adultery. Of course, a magnificent passage in itself, but we're getting these early portions, and we're going to focus in on a couple of specific to our purposes for this day passages, but we need to get a context for today and next week who or whom to whom is Jesus speaking, because it's a mixed group. So after the whole ordeal with the woman caught in adultery, the people want to stone her, Jesus writes something unknown to us but evident to them in the sand, and they're all convicted. They drop their stones and walk away, and Jesus has that last tender encounter uncompromised with the woman. We pick it up in John chapter 8, verse 13, where we read, The Pharisees, therefore, said to him. Now, the scene hasn't changed. She has just walked away. And who is now speaking to Jesus? The religious authorities, the main, not total, but the main adversaries, or one one of the main groups who is adversarial towards Jesus, is now speaking to Jesus. Wow, maybe they've just seen this amazing act of compassion and they're just so truly this man is the son of God we need to follow him or maybe not let's read then the Pharisees therefore said to him Jesus you bear witness of yourself your witness is not true you know their law had a requirement based on the very nature of God by two or more witnesses, every word, every truth is established, seen in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Why is that? Well, John is going to make it clear in First John, because there's three in heaven that agree as one, Father, Son, and Spirit. 
If any one of them, Father, Son, or Spirit, speaks at any time, it only might be one speaking, but it's completely true because there's three always in total agreement. So in human wisdom, the Pharisees see one, Jesus, speaking, and they say, no, you claim to be a law-keeping, observant Jew. You bear witness of yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from and where I am going. Now, in a few words, this sets up the whole situation with this group of people Jesus is speaking to. It is God himself. Some people are getting it. Jesus knows it. Why don't these people understand whom they're talking to and what he's saying? We see a lot of that in John chapter 8. We're going to see a portion of it today. Jesus continues as he enlightens us because apparently they weren't, at least at that time. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. It doesn't minimize the fact that Jesus is the judge of all the earth, right? But he didn't come to condemn people in the flesh. He is revealing spiritual things. Think earlier in the letter, John chapter 3, when he's speaking to Nicodemus, when he told Nicodemus, if I tell you earthly things, you know, how are you going to understand spiritual? Jesus is laying out spiritual realities, and he's pointing out, you're just focused on the carnal things. You know, kind of like, I'm from above, you're from below sort of thing. You judge according to the flesh, in verse 15. Jesus said, I judge no one, and he's referring in the flesh at this time. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. Spiritual truth. I'm not here by myself. Hey, for our abide study, that begins to show us the reality of Jesus with the Father that he's moving us towards Sometimes we feel alone. We know we never are alone. But you know, when we're in a right relationship, it's like, what do you mean? I'm not alone. He's, he's here with me. Yeah, I know you can't see him. That was the case with Jesus and the Pharisees, right? And it's the case with you and I, brothers and sisters. We want people to see the Lord. Well, first, we have to be aware of him all the time. Jesus was. That's our main point in this passage at, that point, at this time. Jesus continues, It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Where's your Father? Again, their minds are not open to spiritual truths. They just look, there's just one of you. Where's your dad? All right? That's what they're saying. Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. Last week we looked at the principle. If you deny the son, you don't have the father either. If you have a different Jesus, which alters it all from the true Jesus, you're not serving God the Father either. You can't serve one and reject the other. That's an aspect of what Jesus is teaching. So again, I'd like to look at verse 19. They said to him, where's your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury, an area of the temple complex as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Many people try, right? But the Father is controlling everything. This is also an aspect of those who abide in the Lord, right? People are going to come against you, but no one is going to short-circuit the Father's plan or timeline for you. In verse 21... We continue. 
Then Jesus said to them again. Now, we're here, as I said earlier, who's he talking to? There's a crowd of people here, but it's the Pharisees whose eyes are closed, whose spiritual understanding is blinded at this point. I'm going away, and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from beneath, and I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. The reality of a spiritual person, in this case Jesus, speaking to an unspiritual person. Christian, this is the way it is when you speak to unsaved people. You can tell them spiritual realities, but they cannot, apart from God's enabling, receive them. Now keep this portion in mind because next week we're going to see a greater difference between the people of this world and the people that are heavenly, seated in Christ. Further lineage is going to be described as, well, the sons of God and the sons of the devil. It's not just one place in Scripture that we see this. And it's important for us to recognize because we still have that old family attraction and relationship in the flesh. So we're seeing Jesus speak to people who are only in the flesh at this time. They can't be with Jesus. They they have to be born again. We get that, right? They don't get that. I don't think they're seeking to get that either at this point. Verse 23, he said to them, you're from beneath, I'm from above. You are of this world, I'm not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, a clear reference to Jesus pointing to himself as God, you will die in your sins. One of the things that happened when a person is born again is their eyes are opened to the nature of who Jesus is. Not just a a good teacher and a noble dude, right? God himself in flesh. Then they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. This is the key passage. Why is that? Because we just saw in 1 John, therefore, let that remain in you, which you heard from the beginning. So we're trying to define what was it that we heard from the beginning? And John didn't say who, right? And we were at this passage before. This is how 1 John starts out. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, a clear reference to the way John started out by the Lord's direction. John's gospel, John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. John knew that, right? Yeah, he was born again. We know that when we're born again. They don't know that. So two things in 1 John, let that remain in you, which you heard from the... What did you hear from the beginning? You heard the word, right? Well, Jesus or the... Yes, right? You can't separate those two. Let's go a little bit further here. Just what Jesus said, I've been saying to you from the beginning. We previously looked at that. What? Yeah, Jesus is revealing who he is by his character, his characteristics. What only God can do would reveal that it is God himself. Jesus tells them in verse 26, I have many things to say and to judge concerning you. So it's not like he's not going to judge them. He's just revealing us. You know, there's a lot here that will happen in the future. But he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. Okay. 
let that remain in you, which you heard. I heard Jesus. I heard the word of God. I heard him tell me recently that I'm supposed to remain in him. I know that what he is, who he is, transfers to me and it shows up in character. Here's one point of identification that further educates me that I'm abiding. One of the characteristics of Jesus when he said, I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. 1 Peter 4.11 backs up. If any among you speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Take this back to what John previously wrote about in his letter. Those who would come in presenting themselves as his but speak perverse things, things that are not of God, completely twisted, to lead the faithful astray. Jesus doesn't do that. Neither do his people whom abide. Very simple, right? Their response follows naturally, verse 27. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you'll know that I am he. And he's talking about when he's lifted up on a cross, when they kill him, that I do nothing of myself. Second point of identification. I do nothing of myself. That's another way of talking about abiding. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides the vine, neither can you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So there it is, Jesus modeling and teaching. And okay, how many things do I do? By, I can do a lot by myself, but nothing of him. Right? I can sin all by myself. And that's really what it is. Even the good things. I'm out there feeding and tending to orphans and widows when the Lord has told me, this is what I've called you to. But this is a good and biblical thing. And I really like it. But Todd, I've called you here. Yeah, but I don't know what he's called me to, so I'm just going to go do a good and biblical thing. Oh, wait a minute. Jesus always knew, right? And that becomes so... He's talking to these people, not why because he always does what pleases the Father. He's telling them these things, why? Because these are the words the Father gave him. Wow, is that what it's like to abide in Christ? Yeah, that's what he's going to grow us into. Right? Let that which you heard from the beginning. Well, I heard Jesus, but now we're hearing so much more of the word of God. Let that abide in you. We'll get to the how, but as we're still looking at the what here. Again, in verse 28, And Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who has sent me is with me, never alone. We talked about it. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. We spoke about it, but there it is in Scripture. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. Okay, we were here, as I said at the beginning, to find out to whom is Jesus speaking these things. The first group we looked at was they're religious. They have a form of godliness, but no power. We're warned about such in 1 Timothy chapter 3. But now, as the truth goes forward, what the Father's giving him, People are now believing in him. Now the group changes. The group to whom Jesus is addressing. Verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him. I'm thinking the Pharisees didn't leave because scripture tells us. But to whom this is addressed changes. I think the Pharisees heard this. But the ones, and maybe some of the Pharisees themselves were not told. But whoever it was, now they have a special message. Please get this, right? It's necessary to be born again, to understand the word of God, to know who God is. But as we say in modern vernacular on late night TV, or at least they used to a couple decades ago, but wait, there's more? Please catch what comes next 
here. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if, conditional, brothers and sisters, if you abide in me, excuse me, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. How? Wait a minute, we believed you, is that not enough? No, believing is essential, but abiding is necessary if we want to be free of all of that which would enslave us. My own desires that take me apart from the Lord's will, the deception that comes from the enemy through other people and other sources, it's if. If you abide, please hear what the Lord is saying today. Abiding is not forced on any of his believing children, right? But it is his good plan. It's what he'll point us towards for those who have believed. It really should be, as we've said before and now say again, it's job one. It's foundational. Forget about the other ministries if they don't happen as a result of abiding. Too many are trying to do things for him, right? But it's not him doing them. What's the evidence? Well, if we keep his commandments, look, he said, you know, feed the hungry, you know, tend to the sick, clothe the naked. I'm, I'm doing these things. No, he said, abide. Where's the joy? How are you finishing? How do you think about other people? These are the evidences, right? If we keep his commandments, it'll result in love towards the brethren, right? So Jesus said, if, right, you abide in my word. So here's one of the things, because we're here trying to determine exactly what the Lord means. Let that which you heard from the beginning. What did we hear from the beginning? Well, that which was from the beginning was God himself. Oh, and Jesus was there. And, well, we became believers by hearing his word. Right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So here's a principle without just taking one passage. We came to the situation of being redeemed in Christ by believing his word and not turning from it. We will continue and grow only by remaining in his word. Oh, I learned something, but now I'm doing Wait a minute. If you abide in me and my word, you are my disciples indeed. Do you get the tie-in to disciples? A disciple is a learner in order to be, not just know what the rabbi or the teacher knows, but to become like the rabbi, like the teacher. We're Jesus' disciples, not just to learn to know what Jesus knows. We want to learn that so we become like Jesus so if you remain in my word, in everything, all the time, because that's what Jesus did, right? His Father's word, all the time. Well, then you'll be, my, that, then you'll be like me. So it really informs me as I think about the, well, I, you know, this is a biblical, did he tell me to do it? Well, I don't know, I haven't heard from him today, yesterday, last week. I think he said something Sunday, or maybe uh, Tuesday I had good deep. What was? I don't know. It didn't remain. Whoa. Whoa. It's a big if. It's conditional. There's so many things that seem to take me away. I want to be free of that. <laughs> so does Jesus. If you abide in me, my word, of, my word, you are my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth. No, become one with it. The truth shall make you free. Oh, this, wait a minute. That's not what the Lord said. That's what Todd thinks might please the Lord. That's not what he directed me like the Father directs Jesus. Oh, I know. This is somebody else or something else trying to take me away with something that looks like it's good, sounds like a sheep, acts like a wolf, you know. Okay. Uh, I see it because I'm abiding in him. If I abide in him, his word abides in me, and I'm free from that. Well, this goes on a little bit further. I'll read this, but this is our bridge to next week. They answered him, 
Now, who's the they? Is it the unbelievers or the believers? That's concerning to me because I know as a believer, I can take up a position contrary to what the Lord so simply says. Right? We're not told. They answered him, Jesus, were Abraham's descendants. They were all Jews and have never been in bondage to anyone. Well, you, the Jews never were in bondage? Okay, they must not be speaking historically. They must be speaking right now because they're free living under their own king and not subject to any other empire or their tax. Well, whoever they are, they're clearly deceived because they're subjects of the Roman Empire at this time. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you'll be made free? This is what deception looks like. Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. Now, we covered this briefly, and John will illuminate it again in 1 John. Christian, it's just like this. Within you is two natures, the one from above, the one from below, right? The one from above cannot sin. When you abide, you don't sin. When you do the one from below, your own thing, doesn't matter what you think or what it looks like or how biblical, if it's you and not the Lord through you, you with the Lord, it's sin, right? It's not like, oh, we got lucky, even a blind squirrel gets one. No, it's sin, In my flesh dwells a few good things that I hold on to, but the rest, no, no good thing, right? Whoever, most assuredly, like Jesus needs to say most assuredly, wow, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Christian, your flesh commits sin only and exclusively. And a slave... That's who I and you are as Christians if we walk according to the old nature. We're in bondage to that. If you've ever noticed a struggle to abide, I was with him this morning, now I'm here, now I, oh Lord, I'm coming. There it is, right? We're beginning to understand more the scope of this. A slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Sons of God, that's next week. Therefore, if the son abides, The Son, Jesus, makes you free. You shall be free indeed. That which is born from above does not sin and is not in bondage. And if we abide there, neither are we. So that's the context of John chapter 8. Remember that for today and for next week we will return. But make our way back now, please, to 1 John chapter 2, verse 24 all this setting up to understand these next couple verses, the therefore trouble can come in from out and can rise up from within. It can look like Jesus, but it isn't Jesus. And a simple definition of antichrist, not the antichrist, but anything else that takes the place of Christ, is anything that presents itself as being of God or done for God that is not done by God. God himself. Anything that represents itself as his that he isn't doing is antichrist. It's another Christ and it's opposed to Christ as we talked about last week. And it can come in from without and from within and therefore we're told let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. What's that? The word of God. Jesus and his word, right? If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and the Father. There's the scriptural support for today, what we already talked about. Anything that I'm contemplating, well, I came up with this all by myself. That's not of God. Didn't work that way for Jesus. Well, I don't know. Well, how about we ask? How about we seek? How about we wait? Clearly, he has promised. Okay. Well, we're already getting into the how-to. We're still stuck in the what, right? And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. John chapter 17, verse 3, now famously and often repeated, Jesus said, and this is eternal life, that they believe in you, the one true God, and in your son, Jesus, right? Believe that they depend in you, depend, that's what believe means, exclusively, in God, the Father and the Son. 
That's it. Well, I think I can go do this. No, that's not abiding, right? I'm depending on God. I don't know what God says. Well, ask him and depend, right? But he told me this, and I, I, I don't see how I can make this happen. That's you. If he said it, depend on him, you will see it happen. Stand still, and you will see the salvation of God, that wonderful example from the book of Exodus as the Lord parted the waters through Moses. This is the promise. God said, oh, he'll not leave you nor forsake you. Well, now that you're always with me, I'll just depend on you, and everything you want to do, you'll make happen, and it won't be sin. I'll be walking in the light. This is pretty great. Verse 26, these things, says the Lord, through our brother, I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. That's all the way back a couple verses to the Antichrist, just recognizing that it comes. Because my own understanding in the flesh doesn't, well, I can't, man. That was Wednesday's exercise that I shared briefly. I'm trying to wait for a month, what about this? I can't just get with the Lord for a month. What are you saying, man? You can't abide? Well, no, I can't, but the Lord, oh, wait. Oh, wait. How about this? How many wonderful in human terms, teachers. It can't be wonderful if it's not the Lord's teachings. That, well, what's, you know, how do I know if I'm on track with the Lord? Well, are, are you mostly doing what the Lord says? Yeah, it seems like. And, and I've heard it broken down in all kinds of different ways that manifest in the physical, but wait a minute. When you're doing what the Lord says, it's him through you. At that time, you're good with the Lord. When you're not, you're not. It's that simple. But we don't want to buy into that. I heard, and I've shared this with brethren, I heard in a dramatized account, somebody's testimony, a story of a Christian who was apparently born again, had time, and got into the most heinous things, back and forth between drug culture and adultery and murder and all the bad things. That's what we think, sin, any sin is a bad thing, right? But in the course of his telling, he said, I never surrendered my, well, my will to do what I wanted. I never let go of that. Well, if that, I can always do this. He never brought that to the Lord and said, I, I need this gone. And it wasn't until he did, right? And it, it spoke so loudly to me because as long as I keep that option open, yeah, you know, I'm mostly good with the Lord. I think I you know, did my devos and that. I'm a little comfortable now. It's like, what do I want to do now? How do I want to relax? Why? Because in his presence isn't fullness of joy. Because the things of God aren't all that, or I wouldn't be looking for something else. Doesn't mean that I go and live in a cave and shave my head and wear wool and don't speak to people. Brethren have tried that. I'm in the world, but I'm living for Jesus. And while well, he's living through me, it's no longer I who live. That's what abiding looks like. It's not the absence of things, it's the absence of self driving the bus at any given point. These things I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. Deception can come from a lot of sources, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, just as he has taught you, you will abide in him. Now this was written as the, well, the encouragement and the answer to what happened. How do I know if I'm, are you deceived? I don't think so. Well, that's what I would think if I was deceived, right? How do you know? Well, What's the anointing? What is that? Well, just like that which we heard from the beginning, that is certainly, well, has characteristics unique to himself, but he's also a who. And if you've got your marker here, please turn with me quickly, uh, or, or slowly, doesn't matter, to John chapter 14. The anointing, that or who prevented the Pharisees from understanding Jesus? Look what Jesus says. Because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Right? It's because they didn't have the Holy Spirit. The Apostle John certainly did. 
the born again brothers and sisters to whom he was writing, explaining, and teaching did, and they understood what he was meaning. And it's by that we understand, hey, it's not by our own resources or anybody else's. It's only by God, this anointing. And let's read about this in reference to abiding. In John chapter 14, verse 15, there's that conditional thing again, words of Jesus. If you love me, keep my commandments. Remember the two identifying signs in 1 John chapter 2? Obedience to his commandments and love for the brethren. Well, first, it's our love for God. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father. And he, the Father, will give you another helper that he may meno with you forever. That's the Greek word, remain or abide in English. Now, please notice, how long does the Holy Spirit abide with the redeemed? Until they walk away from him. No, forever. He literally enters in and and seals himself in, locks the door. That's why the Lord tells us, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed. He's there all the time, just waiting for everything the Father wants to do. Speaking of him, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. It's not like they don't want to know what the Lord knows, but they, they can't receive, well, the Holy Spirit because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells in, dwells with you, will be in you. That was before the Holy Spirit was given. I'll not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Now, this is where we just have to tap out the, the fine edges of the relationship of where the father ends and the son begins. I don't think that's applicable to the relationship, but that's sometimes how we think about it. Well, is he talking about the Holy Spirit, or is he talking about he himself, Jesus? Yeah, I and the Father are one. And Jesus prayed in John 17 that we, well, the disciples' presence and those of us who would believe on Jesus through their word, would all become one as the Lord himself is one. So much so that the character, just like Jesus was representative of the Father, When Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father, that will become true of everyone who abides in God. That's another way we know. Hey, this isn't looking like Jesus. It isn't Jesus, right? And that's what he's growing us into, right? So when he says of the Holy Spirit who is to come and I will come to you, well, that's exactly correct. Now, he says many things of the Holy Spirit here, but let's jump to uh, chapter 16, just to write a little bit, verse 5. Jesus said to them later, right after the abide chapter, I love how it's sandwiched in the two, between the two chapters where he describes the giving and the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 16, verse 5, now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? They seem to be in the know because he told them. But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. Speaking of, well, the Holy Spirit, right? The anointing. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he'll convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. That's the Holy Spirit's message to the world. That's why they hated Jesus. That's why they hate people who represent Jesus, right? I will not have that man to reign over me. That's just the carnal response. But The Lord says, speaking of the Holy Spirit, verse 8, when he has come, he'll convict the world's sin, righteousness, and judgment of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, zeroing back in, verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. This is an important verse to us because it tells us that God's work in transforming us is progressive. He builds just like step by step you lead me and I will learn to walk in your ways. We all have a little bit of Christ, but as Paul said, I've not apprehended, but I press on. It's a continual, constant process as we abide and only if we abide. Right? 
So in verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. This is what the leading of the Lord, more on that next week, looks like. Well, I was here, but I don't know. It's like, wait a minute, I'm just trusting you, Lord. And, oh, he's working me. And it's, wow, scriptures start to come to my mind. I I'm, I'm begin to be confirmed. I've come out of the dark and into the light. So many ways we can describe this because there's so many ways he has and does describe it. Right? Verse 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you into all truth. He'll not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he'll speak. Hey, who does that sound like from John chapter 8? Well, Jesus. Yes, that's exactly how close they are. So what's the evidence of the Holy Spirit working in you, me, us, when we speak, if we're abiding? Well, I heard a good one last week. Here it is. Uh, That's one of my things, obviously. Uh, This is what the Lord has shown me. Well, this is what God has said. This is what the Father has brought to my mind. If any amongst you speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Woo. Now, does that mean we never have a, a God-led conversation? I'm going to be careful there. I don't think Jesus ever didn't. But I know this, in the church and certainly in the context of those who would present themselves as God, those who would scratch itching ears, those we're supposed to be aware of, and those we should certainly be able to know. That's, I don't care what you say, who you say is, I, that's not Jesus. My sheep hear my voice. We'll get to that in a moment. Let's finish this up. When it's the Holy Spirit, he's given us the word. It's not just that rare. We, we tend to compartmentalize it. Okay, uh, don't premeditate on what I'm going to say in that moment. He's going to give it to me. And then the Lord gave it to me. That's real, of course. But it goes beyond that. It went beyond that with Jesus. Certainly it'll go beyond that with us. We would always speak in accordance, in agreement with the Lord. I think that's the evidence. Okay, so speaking of the Holy Spirit, I'm backing up yet again to verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you into all truth. He'll not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak. And he'll tell you things to come. Because God knows the end from the beginning and he reveals things as he wills. Now look at verse 14, the ultimate single verse test of the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said he, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me. Right? Glorify has those two main aspects, giving appropriate honor and manifesting his, well, his character. Man, it's like make revealing him in us. That transformation, the work is of making you like Jesus, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.19 tells us that so very clearly. And Jesus is announcing it before the church was taught on that. He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. You're not going to go to church and hear what's of the world and what you want to hear and declare it to you. Even if they say, well, no, this is, we're all followers of Jesus. No, that's not abiding. That's not the work of the Holy Spirit. He'll take of what is mine and declare it to you. Now, I'm just going to direct your attention to the next subheading if your Bible has them. The chapter says, sorrow turned into joy. As we make our way back to 1 John here in just a moment, remember the, the, the big thing of this relationship when it's an abiding relationship when it's done right, when it's actually the Lord doing it. It's better. There's this lyric of this song, praise song. The Lord says, speak to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, right? And it's like, it's a modern one. It's a, it's, it's a new song, right? And the lyric in short is this, knowing that you are so much more than the things I leave behind. Hey, if I follow Jesus, other things I'm not following anymore, But the reality is there will be more joy in being with the Lord than the things which I'm turning away from. It doesn't deny that there's not momentary pleasure in those things, but it's greater, fullness of joy, that your joy would be full. And it's his. It's infinite God's. 
So that's got to be a clear identifier if I'm abiding. It's not just speaking the truth in biblical things. Like This is hard things, things that are contrary to the world. I, I don't want it any other way. These are the things that God promises and the things that we realize when we're abiding in him. Okay, we're getting kind of close to the end as we make our way back to 1 John. Two big things. Let that which remains in you, which you heard, let that remain in you which you heard from the beginning. What is that which we heard from the beginning? The word of God. And we, we put our complete dependence on it. You know, and as the Lord adds things, we don't depart from that position. We didn't learn them and now I go off and do something else. No, that's not letting that remain in us. People are going to try and deceive us. They're going to present themselves as Jesus, antichrist, antichristoi, as we talked about last week. The plural form, not the antichrist, but anything that re represents itself as the Lord that he's not doing, whether it's somebody else or me, that's antichrist. Stands in the place of Christ, usurps his position, right? And it's always going down. But, verse 27, the anointing, the Holy Spirit, who's always with us, abides with us forever, which you've received from him, abides in you. Oh, that's right. Why am I looking anywhere else? Lord, guide me in this. Now, this next passage, we referred to it last week, but let's flesh it out just a little bit more. Let's make it obvious. Right? And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Now the immediate context is, is deception. It's spiritual discernment. We think for a moment, wait a minute, I have the Holy Spirit. I don't need anything. Well, what about the Lord saying in Ephesians 4, he's appointed teachers, right? What he's saying is discernment, the ability to tell between what is of God and not of God comes directly from God through, well, the person of the Holy Spirit. Well, how did the church know that? Because John's teaching them that right here. It's the Lord through John. So you see the point. He's not denying that the Lord doesn't use biblical teaching. He's just denying that it comes anywhere else from God himself in the area of discernment. Here's our bridge to next week. I love the subheading as kind of a clue to where we're going in your Bibles, the children of God. And now, little children, how the Father looks at us no matter how far we've walked with him because we are his children. Abide in him. There it is. Now you know what to do. Hey, let me make you and me and us accountable. We've learned some things about abiding, but you know what's remaining in him? Remaining in intimate fellowship... Everything's his word. Everything says what he is saying, what he's directing, like Jesus to the extent that we understand it right now. Whatever that is, you get there and you don't leave. That's what God has just said to all of us. That's what he said to them. Yeah, okay, but I'm going to do this. That's sin. It's so easy, but it's so simple. So easy to sin, that is. Right? If you're thinking you're really making this tough, well, good. I mean, just simply declaring it like it is. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. But here's, here's the encouragement. Now, little children, abide in him. That when he appears, now he's talking about the future appearance, as we talked about, that they were waiting on. They knew it was imminent. It could happen at any time. They were looking for his any moment unannounced return. Right? And they understood that, wow, I'm gonna, he's going to show up and he's going to find us however we are. That when he appears, we may have confidence, not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, Jesus, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And so he's just saying that new birth, the new being, those who are abiding in him are led by, it's, it's only going to be righteous. And now all you have to do is stay there and be righteous from here on out. That's it. Don't, don't minimize it. Don't think that the command is anything else. Don't think God's grading on a curve. There's either abiding and there's non-abiding. That's what we heard from the beginning. Thus with Jesus, we heard the truth and we remained in it. Now, he's taught us more and this is more. Okay. Now we got to get to the necessary part. We understand the, the scope of the command, maybe part of it. 
how on earth are we going to do that when none of us have to this point? Well, it's one word. word. It's one word, right, right from verse 24. After the therefore, the next word, let. I love that word. I've spent some time doing the research on There's so many lets. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom. That was further teaching to the church. Same thing. Let it. Let it. Not, not make it. And the let is implied because the Greek says, hey, it, it'll happen if you don't do anything contrary. So the English word, has, you just let it happen. Stay abiding and don't do anything contrary to that. I have something to share with you here. And it's, well, it ties into the way chapter 2 started. Christ is the propitiation. He's the only just one that's satisfactory to the Lord. When Jesus told us, apart from me, you can do nothing, he's not saying, okay, it's, it's all great and wonderful. Now, here's something hard and heavy. He's saying, no, this is what abiding is. Staying with me where it's easy and joyful. Spend some time during announcements. There's an encouragement to go back and really spend time with the Lord and learn more about abiding. I want to close up with a quote from our brother in, well, the study that we looked at. is from the third chapter. I'm going to read a little bit of context and I'll go back and emphasize the main point. So from the third chapter of the Abide in Christ study, our brother said this, many of us agree it's a duty and a privilege to abide. You know, something that we're supposed to do. That's kind of the let, right? I understand. Jesus said abide in Christ. When I'm not, I'm in sin. If I heard Jesus say that, I got it. And it's a privilege we say that, right? So I, hopefully we can connect with what our brother just said. But we always hesitate when the question is asked, is continuous fellowship with Jesus possible? And then he gives a human perspective. Maybe for those prominent Christians, right? <laughs> there should not be such thing. Who've been given time and grace to learn it. But for us with busy lives, it seems impossible. The more we hear about this life and its glory and blessings, the more we want it. I, I just want to add something here. Seth. And maybe you tell us, well, I know it's going to happen, but not here. Oh, it'll be when in the millennium. Well, yeah, in the millennium, certainly. But Jesus is talking here. So when he says, I, I, I connect with him here, it seems impossible. The more we hear about this life and its glory and blessing, the more we want it. But we are too weak and unfaithful. We'll never achieve it. Yeah? However, abiding in Christ is meant for weak Christians as well, especially because they are weak. Hey, there's something I heard once like, when I am weak, then... I am strong, and it's his strength in us. So I love that our brother wrote, because they're weak, you might even say, because they're humble, right? Wait a minute. I can't do this. Our brother said, it doesn't depend on doing great things. It doesn't require us to first be holy and devoted. No, it's simply a weak person trusting the mighty one to be kept. The unfaithful one, that's me and you and us apart from Christ, fully surrendering to the one who's trustworthy and true. Now this part. Abiding in him is not work that we have to do in order to enjoy his salvation, but allowing him to do everything for us and in us and through us. It's a work he does for us, the fruit and power of his redeeming love. Our part is simply to yield, trust, and wait for what he has planned to do. I'm going to go back and emphasize that last part now. Think of the word let that we just took from Scripture. Abiding in him is not a work that we have to do in order to enjoy his salvation, but allowing him, my mind says, let. Lord, you know, what I heard from the beginning was just you did this for me and if I ask and trust you, you'll make this new life possible. Yep. What you heard from the beginning, you just let that remain with you. 
Well, now I'm hearing some more stuff. Remember what you did at the beginning? Yeah? Do the same thing. You said, I couldn't do this, but if I abide, bear much fruit. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So when my brother says, allowing him to do everything for us and in us and through us, let. The Lord's saying, just, just all these things are true. If you abide in me, if you let me make that a reality, oh, I'll be honored. I'll be glorified. I'll be joyful. My joy will be, and you'll be fruitful. All those things. Let me make it happen. Let me make it a reality. Our brother finished up with, it's a work he does for us. The fruit and power of his redeeming love. The fruit and power. It is the power of his love that produces the fruit of his love in us. Our part is simply to yield. Again, my mind says, let. Just let him do it. Trust and wait for what he has planned to do. That was only just one little bit of what we spent some time. It's good to review these things now and again because I'm hearing it right from his word. Let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. Well, he's taught me, you and us, some more things. We just got to ask, trust and wait, and we'll see it. There's a million things that he's made me aware of, more hypersensitive to, that I'm tense. It's like, well, going to go there? Or going to stay with me? Lord, I want to stay with you, but I can't do this by myself. So let's ask. Father, just to thank you, to praise you, to honor you by believing that your word is true. Lord, we know it's true. For all of us that you have saved, your spirit is in us. We have your anointing because we have you telling us, this is the good way, walk in it. This is the truth. Let no one deceive us. Father, we have heard your word confirmed by your spirit. And we realize the ability to do it doesn't come from us. But you never said that, Lord. You said to come to you and to stay with you, to take your yoke. The Father in you did the works, Lord. It's you in us who will do the works as well. If we seek you, find you, ask you, trust you. Lord, I know there is so much more to learn about you and how you work, but you've given us these things today and you desire it and will make it happen. So Father, I just offer myself with my brothers and sisters in this request, acknowledging that you perhaps have more that you will add through us, but I'm asking, Lord, I want that to be a reality for your glory and our joy, Lord, that the world, that we would see you, Lord, the world would see you, that we would have much fruit, Father, by which you are glorified. Father, if there's more that you would have us ask you for now, if there's more that you would say to us that we would bring before you in this time of prayer, we just look to you and yield to you and allow you to move amongst us to bring forth anything else that you, not that we, that you would be indicating to bring before you at this time. And so, Father, we do as we wait upon you in this time of prayer.